Josh Millett, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thanks for having me, John. Yeah, I'm super excited to have this conversation. Uh, you know, as we got connected and I was preparing for this episode, uh, I was just so fascinated by um, aspects of your bio and, and your background, your academic background, and your, your expertise as you've moved into the business world and, and doing some really amazing things. So I'll share more with, about that with listeners in just a moment. But today we're going to be focusing on the importance of emotional intelligence in leadership and the modern workplace. Uh, I think this is an incredibly important topic. Uh, it's something that should resonate with listeners. And I think any leader should be thinking about how can they manage um, and enhance and improve their own emotional intelligence, but also how can they help their their people to do the same so that we can all work more uh, effectively together and collaborate more uh, efficiently and, and innovate and do all those things that will help the organization be more successful. Um, as we get started, I just wanted to share Josh's bio with everyone. Josh Millett is founder and CEO of the Los Angeles-based Criteria, a pre-employment assessment company with a simple goal to help organizations make better hires. Founded in 2006, the company touts over 20 million assessments administered globally and has helped organizations make objective, data-driven hiring decisions that lead to better business outcomes with its scientifically, valid, uh, scientifically validated assessments across multiple dimensions, including aptitude, personality, and skill. On average, Criteria has helped organizations increase their hiring success rates by an average of 52%, reduce turnover by 48%, and generate 25% more revenue. Uh, and that's incredible. Those are incredible outcomes. Prior to launching Criteria, Josh co-founded an online test preparation company, Number2.com, which was acquired by XAP Corp in 2002. Josh holds a PhD in history from Harvard where he was a Fulbright Scholar and a Mellon Fellow. Emotional intelligence and why it's very much needed when hiring candidates in this day and age of remote working is really his focus, his area of expertise, and I'm just so excited to have Josh on today. Welcome, Josh. Thank you, John. Thanks for that great intro. And I have to say, um, you know, we, we're both uh, kind of the scholar-practitioner kind of orientation uh, my PhD is in sociology, not in history, but certainly there's some overlap, you know, in terms of social social sciences there. Uh, and I was a Fulbright scholar uh, twice over in uh, Belarus and Indonesia. Where did you do your Fulbright? Really cool. I was in Paris, so a little less off the beaten, uh, beaten track. Yeah, very, very cool. Um, well, as we get started, is there anything else you would like to uh, share with listeners by way of personal background or professional background or context for the topic. Absolutely. Yeah. As you mentioned, my, my background, John, is actually in history, but uh, both the companies that I've been involved with over the last 20 years have been focused on assessment, either from an educational perspective or um, now more in the corporate space, obviously. Um, so you might ask, well, what business do I have, <laughs> you know, talking about uh, psychological assessments? Um, both my co-founders are psychologists, and so I've, uh, I, I was fortunate enough to make friends with a bunch of psychologists in uh, grad school. I don't know if that means that, that, that they were more fun than historians or not, but <laughs> that's the group I gravitated to. And so I've learned a lot from them and now being in the um, corporate assessment space for almost uh, 20 years. Yeah, well, that's, that's really great. And, you know, we, we share some interest in, in some work in that area as well. I, I also have done uh, quite a bit in terms of psychometrics and assessment um, generally across organizations for various organizational you know, issues and outcomes, but also specifically in the uh, pre-screening and hiring process, onboarding and those sorts of things. So uh, it's, it's a really important um, area. And frankly, there's a lot of organizations out there that do it, but they don't do it very well. Um, and so when you find a company uh, and you find a tool that works really well, I think it's something to be highlighted and, and you know, so that the organizations can, can make better decisions. And in this day and age where, you know, we have so much technology to assist in these types of HR related practices that we need to leverage it, we need to utilize it. Absolutely, yeah, we, we like to call it evidence-based HR, you know, and, and um, 
historically, we've been focused, um, as you mentioned, John, really on that pre-hire space. So sort of helping with what I, what I like to think of as the most important kind of talent decision that companies are making, which is the one right up front, you know, who, who to hire. Um, we are beginning to expand out into post-hire. You mentioned onboarding. I think that's an area where assessments can have real value as well. Um, and so we're launching a team, team building and um, a product soon that will be more oriented around growth and development. But most of our work to date in the last 12 years has been on that pre-hire employee selection space. And so that's where we've really been focused. Um, we actually just got into emotional intelligence much more recently. We acquired a company in Australia uh, right before COVID um, called Revelion, and they've really been a leader in uh, game-based assessments. And specifically, one of their assessments that we were really interested uh, in is called Emotify, which is a game-based assessment of emotional intelligence. Um, so kind of one of one of the first of its kind there. And um, and that I think is is going to be really useful as we move beyond pre-hire into you know post-hire and, and learning and development type of use cases for for assessments. Yeah, very cool. What a what an interesting way to do emotional intelligence assessment. If I'm understanding understanding correctly, it's game based. That's that's right. Yeah, it, it uses a series. It's about a 15 to 20 minute assessment, and um, it takes the user through a series of kind of interactions where you're. Um, reacting to different uh, facial expressions on the part uh, on, on the screen that you see, and then and then in the context of specific um, scenarios, you're you're reacting to them as well. So you know, obviously, one of the foundational pieces of of EI is the the self awareness, the, the piece, the um, the ability to perceive and understand emotions. And so, a lot of the assessment is focused on that, and then. Uh, and then it gets into a little bit of the applied um, part of it, which is which is the other part of EI, of course. Very cool. And actually, let's back up just a moment. Um, I, I suspect most listeners understand what EI is, but uh, do you do you mind just sharing a quick kind of overview of of emotional intelligence, what it is, and why it's important for organizations? Sure. Yeah. So I would uh, describe it, I think, a, a really good general definition because there are sort of competing views of, of what it is. But I think one that most people are, are aligned around is that EI involves the ability to um, perceive and understand and use and manage uh, our emotions and um, our relationships with others. So those are the sort of, sort of four pieces um, that I think people are, are aligned around. So kind of self-awareness, self-management, and then social awareness and relationship management. So half of it is kind of about knowing yourself and um, knowing your own emotions. And the second is um, being aware and, and, and uh, helping to manage the, the emotions of, of those around you. Yeah, and I, and I hope for obvious reasons, like we, we all understand and listeners, as you're hearing that description, you know, why this would be so important for leaders to have high levels of emotional intelligence based on the type of work that they're doing and the constant interactions that they're having, um, not just with their people and their teams and trying to get the most out of their teams, but also the ability or the, the, the capability that leaders need to have to connect across the organization um, and, and understand and work in cross-functional and cross and interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary types of ways. Uh, I think it's just so important that, that leaders develop that skill. Um, and it's something that can be developed over time if you're, if you're focused on it, if you're aware of um, what's driving you and, and how you respond to different stimuli and those sorts of things, you can learn to, be, uh, to, to respond in more effective, more constructive types of ways to the different uh, scenarios that you find yourself in. And the more, like you said, the more we understand ourselves, the more we will be capable of understanding others and the more we can model good emotional intelligence behaviors and, uh, and also help our people to do the same. So, so it's just, it's super important for organizations really across all levels to have a high level of emotional intelligence uh, and for leaders, I think in particular. Um, let's talk a little bit more about uh, emotional intelligence and the emotional intelligence in the hiring process. And so you're doing these pre-screenings, you're trying to figure out um, a, a range of things as you're doing these pre-screening assessments. Uh, why emotional intelligence at that stage? Yeah, sure. So I, I, I think you hit the nail on the head, John. So 
Um, you know, initially when EI became a concept that people were aware of, you know, 15 or 20 years ago, I think for a while, you know, the hype got ahead of the, <laughs> the head of the science in terms of um, the research that, that was done there. It was sort of um, hailed by some people as, you know, a, a panacea for everything in the workplace. Um, and as more and more research comes out, it, it's been shown that it's, it's not appropriate to select for emotional intelligence in all roles, right? Um, there are some where it's more important and more predictive. And um, you, you really uh, went to the heart of it with leadership. So there's a growing uh, body of evidence that in managerial positions or roles where you're managing people, um, that EI can really be a, a helpful predictor of outcomes. Um, also in roles that involve a lot of interaction with people that aren't managerial roles. So things like sales people or customer service or any service type roles can be really important. Um, there's, also, there's also evidence that in certain roles it's counterproductive <laughs> to have IEI. So it's, it's not something that universally should be used across the board. But when you have a position that involves um, you know, interacting and relating to people, managing people, um, that's where it can be most effective and most predictive. And that's where a lot of the cool studies are being done in terms of, um, you know, EI as a predictor of outcomes in the workplace is really more on the managerial level, more on those roles that involve a lot of social interaction. Um, and that's what like the big meta analyses have shown is that it's particularly important and relevant in some of those areas. Um, and so that's how we try to encourage its, its use. Um, you know, there's also, I mean, there's a lot of other things you can measure through assessments in the, in the selection uh, area. So things like cognitive or behavioral assessments, even uh, skills assessments, which uh, there's not quite as much science behind that last group. They're, they're more, um, uh, more of a thing you'd use with, with certain positions just to, just to know that certain skills are there. But, um, you know, in combination with cognitive and behavioral assessments, EI can be a really great thing to, to explore um, in the selection process because it does give you that other layer. And we know, for example, that being very smart or having uh, good cognitive ability is really effective up to a point. But beyond that, you look at leaders across a lot of organizations, a lot of them are smart. And so if you're looking for that incremental validity, we call it, um, you know, EI can be really valuable there because it can explain why someone who's very smart and succeeds in a managerial role and, and someone else who's also smart does not. And the difference can be um, those EI uh, factors. Yeah, and I appreciate you acknowledging, you know, the, the, the appropriate usage, you know, of, of different metrics in the screening process um, because that's absolutely true. And, you know, we could, we could extend that to, for example, personality assessments. Um, they can, they can, yeah. they can be useful in a lot of ways, um, but there are also time, there are many times where it's not appropriate to use them, right? And so, just just acknowledging that, recognizing um, when it's going to be more helpful and and productive, uh, and actually, I mean, ultimately, the goal is to make better hiring decisions um, based on on skills, knowledge, ability, capability. Exactly. and fit and and get the right people you know in into the organization so you and then have better retention because there's a better fit right that's ultimately the goal and we want to to use these types of assessments in a way that will allow us to accomplish that that that's exactly right the most important thing if you're thinking about using assessments um, either in the hiring process or at other points in the employee life cycle is is test selection really because if you don't choose the right assessments um you're, you're probably not gonna have good, good outcomes no matter how uh, well validated the assessments are. And the, and the key concept there that we like to speak to our customers about is job relatedness. You know, you need to be measuring things that you know are job related. Um, and that's why EI is, is more effective in some roles and, and not that helpful in others. Um, you know, if you think about a managerial role or a leadership role, it just, it just makes sense that um, interacting with other humans, you know, getting the most out of them, empathizing when appropriate, um, it is a key driver of, of outcomes. And so um, that's one of the most important things when, when you're implementing any kind of assessment, whether it's EI or otherwise, is just making sure that the stuff you're measuring um, in the assessment is stuff that's important to the role. So it, it seems like a basic concept, but sometimes people, um, people forget that. 
Yeah, amen. It, well, yeah, it does. It is kind of a basic concept, but people mess that up all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. And, and, and it's, why, like it's why they hire people like you and me to come in and help them with their with their screenings and their assessments and their their surveys and stuff because, you know, it sometimes it, it just is a little counterintuitive to how you know people think you know what people think might or um, you that's we right. have to be careful. Yeah. Yeah, or they, they have like the name of an assessment that they've used or known and uh, want to use it in all situations um, where a lot of the things we assess for are context specific or job specific. So uh, it's an important rule of thumb is, is, you know, start with the job and move out from there in terms of assessing competencies or, or things that will predict, predict success in the role. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm curious what your take is on like the current dynamic that we're in you know, there's a global pandemic, there's at least in the US, I, you know, I think globally as well, but particularly in the US right now, where there's kind of a contentious political um, environment. And we have, we have uh, broader, you know, stresses and anxieties around just societal elements at the moment, right? So there's all these strains being put on businesses and being put on leaders, and more and more people working remotely. What, what do you think the role is of emotional intelligence in leading a remote workforce or an increasingly remote workforce uh, and and how can it be you know better utilized um, you know at, at a time like this yeah it's it's a fascinating time um, right uh, I think that you know because we, we spoke we speak to um, HR executives and leaders every day and and the, and the two big things that I think they're they're dealing with um, that are not necessarily new, but but certainly the the scale and scope of them is new. Is is that remote work factor? Obviously, that a lot of people are operating under, and because of all the social upheaval in the country, there's also a really big focus on bias and how to how to remove bias from your from your hiring process. And I actually tend to think um, my own view is that that second one may be the more lasting one. Um, you know, you hear so much about how remote work is, is transforming things, and it certainly is, and I, I don't think that will change, you know, post-vaccine or, you know, post-COVID. I think there will be more remote work happening than there was before. We've, we've passed a, a critical threshold there. But I also think that the, the focus on removing bias is going to be incredibly um, enduring in, in HR circles. I've had more conversations with DNI people, with diversity and inclusion people in the last six months than I did in the 10 previous years, <laughs> you know, of operating the business. There's just a real focus on using tools that can help remove bias. There's an awareness of unconscious bias. Um, and so I think that, that is all very good and, and, and will drive improvements in the future. I think assessments have a big role to play there. Um, but with respect to remote work, um, I think EI is really interesting. I think, you know, remote work brings all these new and unique challenges because if you think about it, right, John, the, the ingredients that, um, I guess, inform someone's EI, so many of them come from like subtle social clues, like body language and mannerisms that are harder to pick up uh, over Zoom or, you know, in a remote uh, work setting. Um, so some people will thrive in those remote settings and, and others will struggle. And it's, especially for managers, it's more important um, than ever, I think, for managers to have um, high EI, right? In order that they can kind of recognize the, that people are having different reactions to this new environment um, to better support those who are, who are struggling or need help. Um, and, you know, living where we work, um, I mean, I, I can, attest to this even in my house with my kids on Zoom for school and two, two young kids. And, uh, it, you know, it creates new stressors for a lot of people and family obligations can interfere with work. And so I think that um, where EI can help there is just that, you know, recognizing and empathizing with this new, um, this new lived reality that we're all in is really vital. Um, and the other, the final thing I'd say there too is that you know, remote work places more emphasis on the written world, word. So we're like, we're doing all this stuff by email that we might have just popped into someone's office to, to do <laughs> beforehand. Um, and so another big application of EI, I think, in, in that remote scenario is kind of recognizing what kinds of communications can be handled by email or chat and which ones are better, better handled, um, if not in person, because that may not be possible, but at least by, by video. So. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. I, I think I think it's probably more important than ever to have high levels of, of EI uh, as you're trying to, you know, keep 
tapped into the pulse of, of your, your workforce, especially if they're remote and you're not having as many um, typical, you know, casual interactions or just like those, right, li yeah. those little touch points. And, and it does speak though to, you know, perhaps the value of just jumping on quick, you know, zoom calls to touch base with somebody. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if you're writing out an email, you know, I, I'm not one for like scheduling all sorts of extra meetings. I'm not saying that, right. but you know, just, just informal, like hop on, um, take a few minutes, touch base, similar to how you might have just popped into someone's office for a minute previously. Um, and exactly, and you, yeah. you can, you can create the norms, you know, for your team about what's appropriate, you know, in terms of how you do those pop-ins and stuff. But I, I do <laughs> think, I think it's, it's helpful to be able to, to see facial expressions. It's helpful to, to be able to read body language and tone of voice and those sorts of things, you know, as we're trying to gauge anxiety levels, stress levels, burnout, you know, all that kind yeah. of stuff with our teams. Yeah, email, email is just really a, a flat medium, you know, it doesn't convey nuance well. And um, I, I think that, you know, good leaders need to recognize when uh, email is not the right tool. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Josh, I want to be respectful of your time. I know you have other stuff you need to get off to, but uh, before we close today, I wanted to make sure I gave you a chance to share with listeners um, how they can get connected with you, find out more about your business, uh, and and just give us the last word on this issue. Yeah, thanks. So if people want to check out our uh, assessments or a lot, we created a lot of great content in the area of EI as well. The best way to do that is through our website, which is criteriacorp.com. Um, you can also uh, take a look at all the other assessments we have there. Read about Emotify, which is our new game-based assessment. Um, you can also uh, find me on LinkedIn, um, but criteriacorp.com is probably the best place to get more information. Excellent. Well, thank you, Josh. It's, it's really been a pleasure to connect and have this discussion. And we really do have so many touch points of, of commonality and overlap and our background and, and, and our passions and, and the type of work that we do. I hope that listeners will reach out to Josh, get connected, find out more about what uh, Criteria can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope everyone has a great rest of their week. Thank you.